In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord to me, make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. What a peculiar thing. Why is he asking him to do this? Jehovah is bringing judgment upon the entire world, if you will. He is putting the entire world under the authority of the king of Babylon. That did not exclude his own people, the Jewish people. They were to come under that power and authority, all right? So Jeremiah, being a God-fearing man, he does what he is instructed, but not just that. If you're to continue on in the passage, we discover that the Lord commands him something else. And he says, notify the nations, notify my people. This is coming. I will raise Nebuchadnezzar up and you will submit your necks under his authority. Try to wrap your mind around this. If you're a Jew, if you're living in a godly kingdom and a kingdom that is established by God himself, that we're supposed to submit to a pagan king coming in. Try to, try to imagine that, what he's saying. And the Lord warns, you don't do this, you are going to die. And that goes for all the nations. Well, listen to what he goes on to say, because the Lord, being the Lord, knows things before they happen. He knows the beginning from the end, right? Isaiah 46 declares it. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, and your sorcerers who speak to you. What does he say? You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you, to remove you far from the land, and I will drive you out, and you will perish. The Lord warns, guess what, people? I told you to submit yourselves, but I know how the nations and I know how Judea will react. They're gonna rise up men, they're men, they're prophets, they're sorcerers, their soothsayers are gonna rise up and they'll say, no, no, no. We don't have to submit to the king of Babylon. So with this information, we'll dig into our story today. In Jeremiah 28, verse one, we read this. And it happened in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Yehuda, In the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah or Hananiah in the Hebrew, son of Azur, Hanavi, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and all the people. Hananiah is a prophet. He is a prophet of God. And what you need to appreciate is that to be a prophet of God, you had to be known as one whom the Lord has spoken through. This is critical to the story. If you're going to appreciate the story and the gravity and the weight of it, appreciate this. The people knew the prophets. They knew who they were. Hananiah is known here. Now, as we move to verse 2, we're going to discover exactly what Hananiah has to say to the prophet Yirmiyahu. This is what we read in verse 2. Thus says Jehovah Zavot, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Hananiah is prophesying here in the midst of the Kohanim. He's proclaiming that the Lord has broken the yoke of Babylon, which is simply to say he's broken his authority. They will not be under his authority or power. If you go on to read in the following chapters, you actually discover that the Lord is going to do that. The only problem with it is, is it's not going to be for a very long time. In fact, many of the people are going to be dead before it happens. We're given the actual timetable within the book of Jeremiah. The Lord says, I will complete 70 years. There's 10 sabbatical cycles that will be ushered through. And then that will happen which makes what Hananiah is about to tell us very, very interesting. This is what he says in verse three. Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of Jehovah's house that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took away from his place and carried to Babylon. Now he gives a timetable and he's explicit. He doesn't say, ah, it's about you know, a year and a half. He says two full years. It's very explicit. Now, there's something you need to appreciate about all this. What Hananiah just conveyed to the crowd was exactly what they wanted to hear. It was exactly what they were craving. It was exactly what they were praying for. Moving on, Hananiah, he's going to bring more good news to his people. 
In verse four, we read this, and I will bring back to this place Yehaniah, or Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Every last word that Hananiah speaks here was exactly what they desired, that they had shed tears for. They longed to be released from the oppressive rule of Babylon. They longed to have their family back. This certainly looks on every level to be an answer to prayer. But when you couple the fact that Hananiah told the people exactly what they want to hear, and then you couple that with the fact that they know him to be a prophet, and then you add the fact that now he has said, thus says the Lord, what do you have? What are you left with? You're left with the most convincing message you've ever seen. That's what you're left with. It's a message of hope. It's a message of salvation. In fact, I want to show you how powerful this message really was to the point where Jeremiah himself desires to accept it. Look at what is said here in verse five. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Yirmiyahu said, amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words, which you have prophesied. To bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Amazing to see his response. Despite all the emotions that Jeremiah was feeling, the weight of his desires. Know this. He did not give in to those desires, to those emotions. He did not allow emotions to dictate reality. He takes those emotions and he puts them into check. How? Interesting. He takes the entire crowd back to the Torah. And this is what he says in verse seven. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. Verse nine, as for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Well, how does Hananiah respond to Jeremiah's words? Well, we read this in verse 10. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So Jeremiah puts this all in check as he should going to the word of God, going to the Torah. It's interesting. How does Hananiah respond? Does he backpedal? This prophet, he moves forward and he takes this yoke off of of Jeremiah and he breaks it. And then he does something absolutely amazing. He prophesies. He prophesies as he is breaking this yoke and telling them that in two full years, the yoke of Babylon will be broken. Now, You need to appreciate something because everything that these people witnessed, every cell in their body would have told them this is the true prophet of God. Everything we have seen thus far that the Kohanim are witnessing, that all these men of God are witnessing, completely authentic. It lines up with the way God moves. A good counterfeit. I mean, a really good counterfeit. It is indistinguishable from the authentic. It looks exactly like the authentic. Make no mistake, the counterfeit gospel looks like the authentic gospel. God's beautiful uh, message of grace, when the devil comes to counterfeit it, it looks exactly like it. You know, how many of you have been to a department store and you go to a gas station or wherever, and a person, maybe you, maybe the person in front of you, like I've witnessed, they pull out a 20, a new 20, or they pull out a $100 bill and they give it to the cashier and the cashier just kind of looks it over. And then what do they do? 
Well, they're looking at this $100 bill, but they're not able to tell the difference of whether it's a counterfeit or not. They've been trained to go test it. That is exactly what we are called to do because I'm telling you right now, Satan's counterfeit message, his counterfeit gospel of grace, that is not true. It's false. Most people can't tell the difference and they are not trained. They're not testing. They're not trained to test it. What does John say in 1 John? This is what we read. 4.1, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. I want to be very clear on something. He's not talking about spirits of pagan wickedness. Okay, in the sense of that this is how they're going to present themselves. He's saying these spirits that come to you, their spirits are going to seem righteous, but test them. There's no need to test a pagan demonic spirit. If there is a demon that is to stand right before you, I don't need to test it. You're a demon. It's really simple. It's the ones that come as angels of light and ministers of righteousness. It's the emotions that are in your heart that are so powerful. The most powerful force on planet Earth is our emotions. And the deceptions that go in our heart. Heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17. Right? We must test. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor, hit the like button. Don't forget to hit the share. And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you wanna watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you wanna watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your play stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.